continuing with our lecture on how to think like an anthropologist, we want to talk about some anthropological field methods. So one of the primary things we do is ethnography. In fact, cultural anthropologists are often referred to as ethnographers. And this is basically a research strategy where the approach is to get as much information as possible. You try to get this information from as many angles as possible so that we can get a, a holistic view of the culture. So it's descriptive in nature. And there are multiple field techniques to help us do ethnography. And one of them is observation. And there's two kinds of observation. There's where you sit and you watch and you record your observations and then there's also something called participant observation and this is the method that is known in all of the disciplines as anthropological so it was really developed and pioneered by an anthropologist by the name of Branislaw Malinowski when he was working with the Trobriand Islanders. And here's where you not only observe, but you participate and you record as much as possible. And the reason that you want to participate in the activities like learning how to weave or learning a particular ritual or even learning how to hunt or cook with the peoples is so you can try to get to the emic viewpoint. And this is kind of the insider's viewpoint. How do people themselves interpret what's going on around them? So we're trying to get at their worldview and understand their point of view. And this differs from the etic or the edic, which is kind of the outsider's objective kind of view. In an ideal situation, you want to use both of those viewpoints um, in your interpretation. Uh, but it is important to understand how people themselves view the world around them. So participant observation is key. Other thing what we use are conversations and interviews. Um, one of the key things here is to actually be able to learn the language. So many cultural anthropologists will actually go someplace for a year just to learn the language before they even contact a group about getting permission to um, study them. We often use informants, which is a key individual, usually somebody with a lot of knowledge about the group, and we'll interview them and get a small picture of what's going on because one individual is one perspective. We usually try to interview a cross section of the population to get a more holistic picture. We also use genealogies, and this is where we learn about kinship, family, and marriage from gathering data on genealogies. And a little bit later in the quarter, we're actually going to construct some kinship diagrams, so we'll work a little bit with genealogy. We do life histories, and this is the personal history of an individual. And this differs from an informant, because an informant is telling us about the culture as a whole, and a life history is an individual person's life. It can give us insights into perceptions, and again, to try to get a more holistic picture, we will collect several life histories. Ethnographers also do something called ethnology. And this is a cross-cultural comparison. And we can use this to help us understand the differences in cultures and you know why something might look one way in culture A and look something different in culture B, even though their environments are the same. So it just helps us to understand more the human adaptive process. Anthropologists produce ethnographies, and an ethnography is a report on ethnographic work. Uh, we try to do something called ethnographic realism, which is using the edic approach to get scientific objective view of the society. Um, but again, we still want to put in that emic approach, which is kind of interpretive anthropology. So try to get past our own ethnocentrism to understand the uh, native's point of view. We also do something called reflexive ethnography or reflexive anthropology. And this is where we examine our own feelings and reactions. Are they impacting the group? How might we be biased in our interpretations based on our own perspectives? So it's been a really important um, step in cultural anthropology. We also do quite a bit of problem-oriented ethnography. So we don't necessarily just go out and study a culture in total, but we might have a very specific research question and collect data just on that question. So for instance, I have a friend working in Amazonia, and he looks at the effects of modernization on social organization. So it's a very specific, problem-oriented question. Um, but whatever technique and ethnographic approach you use, it's necessary to conduct ethical research. And one of the things you want to do is informed consent. So if the research is going to impact people, you want to make sure that you have their okay before you start researching it. You might have to get permission from the national government, local government, and individuals in order to do this. 
And one of the key things in cultural anthropology is that the welfare and interests of the people being studied always comes first. Now part of the um, difficulty in making ethical decisions is the fact that anthropology has always been an activist discipline. E.B. Tyler, who's the gentleman with the beard here, claimed that s the science of culture is essentially a reformer's science. And Ruth Benedict said that the purpose of anthropology was to make the world safe for human difference. And you can see Ruth Benedict there in the middle. John Bodley has been quoted saying that anthropology is a subversive science. Um, my undergraduate anthropology professor stressed the activist nature of anthropology, and they were working in Northern Ireland and with First Nation peoples. So a lot of first-hand experience and working with governments to try to promote the welfare of the peoples that they were studying. Um, but where do you draw the line between cultural relativism and intervention? And cultural relativism, as you know from your Anthrospeak assignment, is the idea that traits can only be understood within their cultural context. Now, you can have an extreme version of this, where all traits are good within their cultural context. Um, the example in Mirror for Humanity's Nazi Germany would be evaluated as non-judgmentally as Athenian Greece. A more moderate version of that particular idea is that we're all human beings with cultural baggage. We have ideas about what are right and wrong. So for instance, a professor at Ohio State once said that we can be culturally relative and still disagree with the behavior if, and this is an important if, if we try to understand why that behavior exists in the group. In other words, what's the function of the behavior? So if we were looking at some things like human sacrifice and cannibalism or infanticide or female circumcision, these are probably th behaviors that most of us are going to say are really bad and shouldn't and no culture should actually do them. But we can, if we take some time, understand how each of these function within a society. And what I'd like you to do is go to the discussion board and post some possible functions for these four traits. Um, another thing that we run into in anthropology is this to interfere or not to interfere. Um, what do we do if interference is going to change the culture? Is that our role as a researcher? Uh, most anthropologists say that it isn't our job to change things. However, that doesn't mean we can't give people information and then they can do with that what they will. So for instance, in Papua New Guinea, in the highlands, we noticed, or an anthropologist noticed, that there was a high incidence of kuru in women and children. And kuru is basically Crestfield Jacobs, or mad cow disease in humans. <coughs> Excuse me. And after he studied, he found out what was happening is during a funerary feast, people would uh, eat the brain of the deceased individual. Uh, women would be cooking it, and they would taste test the undercooked brain. Um, the reason we were seeing it in children also is that they were giving some to the children at the same time. Um, and that was passing on the parasites that caused this particular disease. And the reason we didn't really see it in men is because they were eating it when it was fully cooked. So the anthropologist ended up telling them about it. And what happened is they just cooked everything. They, the brain completely, they didn't eat it raw anymore. So anyways, it's, it's a big question. Where is that line? Right now in anthropology, there's a pretty heated debate about anthropologists working for the U.S. government in Iraq. Uh, since World War II, there's been mistrust in the anthropological community regarding governments, and particularly the military. In World War II, the military wanted to use anthropological studies to help develop military strategy against the Axis powers. Many anthropologists had trouble with that, as the information could be used in a manner that did not advance the welfare of the people studied. It's the same situation today with the Iraq War. And you can read a relatively recent article about it on the New York Times website, and there's a link to that in the optional readings portion. So the Anth American Anthropological Association has a number of real ethical dilemmas posted on their website. Um, these posts also include comments by other anthropologists who sometimes agree with the researcher's decision and sometimes not. It's interesting information, and I urge you to take a look at a couple of the cases. Again, there's a link in the optional readings. As we begin reading more excerpts from anthropological research, keep cultural relativism and intervention in mind and ask yourself, what are the ethical dilemmas the researcher faced?